Hello, all. On behalf of the Federalist Society Student Division and the Columbia Federalist Society Chapter, welcome to tonight's Betty Knight fight between Julia Mahoney and Andrew Koppelman on overturning Roe, question mark. My name is Reno Varghese, and I'm the president of the Federalist Society Chapter at the Columbia Law School. I'm honored to introduce our distinguished fighters, as well as our referee. First, our referee, Ms. Stephanie Maloney. Stephanie Maloney is the senior counsel at the U.S. Chamber Litigation Center. Previously, she served as chief of staff in the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the United States Department of Justice and practiced in the appellate group at Winston & Strawn, LLP. And now for our fighters, starting with Julia Mahoney. Julia Mahoney is the John S. Battle Professor at the University of Virginia School of Law, where she teaches classes on constitutional law, property law, and feminism. An elected member of the American Law Institute, she is also a member of the Board of Advisors of the New Civil Liberties Alliance, a founding member of the Academic Freedom Alliance, and the co-chair of the Federalist Society Senior Scholars Group. In the other corner, we have Professor Andrew Koppelman. And Professor Koppelman is the John Paul Stevens Professor of Law at Northwestern University. He has written more than 100 scholarly articles and eight books, most recently, Burning Down the House, How Libertarian Philosophy Was Corrupted by Delusion and Greed, forthcoming from St. Martin's Press. And with that, I'll hand it over to our distinguished moderator. Stephanie, take it away. Thank you, Reno. Let me start by saying a big thanks to you, to the Columbia Law School student chapter and to the Federal Society student chapter for hosting tonight's Fetty Night Fight. Thank you to Julia and Andrew for agreeing to enter the ring and thanks to all those who have joined us. I'm pleased to be with you for what promises to be another excellent and lively exchange as a former law school chapter president and now a longtime member of the Federal Society, I've witnessed firsthand the society's commitment to providing a forum for civil and reasoned debate on essential legal questions and often controversial ones. I think we can all agree that's one precedent we'd like to see continue. The same cannot be said for the subject of tonight's fight, aptly titled Overturning Roe. Likely countless fe federal society gatherings have discussed this same question. They've done so because of deeply profound moral, societal, and legal judgments about abortion. And they've done so because answers to this question also say much about how one understands federalism, precedent and stare decisis, and the role of the Supreme Court in a democratic and sometimes politically divisive society. But we face this question in a particularly unique way because for the first time since Roe, the Supreme Court appears likely to overturn it in Dobbs. The case heard this term involves a challenge to a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks. For reference, that's about two months earlier than the period established nearly 50 years ago by Roe and that contradicts the pre-viability line later set out in Casey. To uphold the Mississippi law then seems to require the court to either overturn Roe altogether, sending the question back to the states, or to come up with some new standard to replace viability, an outcome that Chief Justice Roberts seemed to be pressing the advocates for during oral argument. Notably, the advocates at oral argument, the state of Mississippi, the Center for Reproductive Rights, and the Solicitor General of the United States as amicus, all seem to take the view that the court faces a binary decision. Uphold the Mississippi law or uphold Roe and Casey, it can't do both. Tonight, our contestants enter the ring to address the question facing the court in Dobbs, overturning Roe. Entering first is Julia, who will argue that the court has, over time, eroded Roe and Casey to the point of incoherence and that considerations of stare decisis and institutional legitimacy cut against upholding Roe and Casey now. Next is Andrew, who will argue against overturning the right to abortion provided for in Roe by grounding the right in the protections of the 13th Amendment against slavery and involuntary servitude. 
Both will present their opening arguments and be given time for rebuttal before I jump in to moderate a more open discussion and then invite questions from the audience. With that, let's ring the opening bell and turn the fight over to Julia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee and Stephanie, for those introductions. Thanks to the Columbia Law School's Federal Society chapter for hosting this event. I'm looking forward to a serious and substantive discussion with my distinguished co-panelists, Professor Andrew Koppelman, as well as to questions from you, Stephanie, and questions from the audience. In the 15 minutes I've been allotted for my introductory comments, I'm going to focus on five issues. First, I'll raise the question of whether Roe has already, for all practical purposes, or most practical purposes, been overturned. And I'll claim, I think, conclude that the answer is a qualified yes. Second, I'll explain the serious problems with the viability line, which, as Stephanie's opening remarks emphasized, has proved so such a prominent feature of the court's abortion jurisprudence. Third, I'll squarely address the issue of stare decisis, the chief argument offered by defenders of the court's abortion jurisprudence in favor of the court's striking down Mississippi's Gestational Age Act in its pending case, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. Fourth, I'll offer some observations on considerations of institutional legitimacy, particularly the institutional legitimacy of the United States Supreme Court. And to wrap up, I'll ask what next and explain why I believe that whatever the court ends up doing in Dobbs, the court's docket is unlikely to be completely free of abortion cases any time soon. So first, has Roe v. Wade already been overturned? I would say yes. Why? Because upon examination, little now remains of the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade and its companion case, Doe v. Bolton. To recap, in 1973, in a seven to two decision, with a majority opinion by Justice Harry Blackman, the Supreme Court of the United States located the right to abortion in the right of personal privacy in the Constitution, while admitting that the Constitution does not explicitly mention any right of privacy. In support of this outcome, the court offered a number of historical arguments concerning abortion practice in American history, including at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment. Interestingly, in reaching its decision, the court appeared to put great, a great deal of weight on the rights of physicians to exercise their medical judgment. So men's professional rights were fe featured um, in an interesting and prominent way in Roe. The majority opinion went on to lay a complicated framework, lay out a complicated framework which pretty much determined how abortion could be constitutionally regulated in each of the three trimesters of pregnancy. And the Roe framework also emphasized that fetal viability factored into, it, into its determinations, fetal viability, which at that time occurred at roughly the 28th week of pregnancy, the end, very roughly speaking, of the second trimester. The court's reasoning in Roe was subject to ferocious attack, including pointed criticisms from constitutional law experts who took, who took pains to emphasize that they liked the outcome in Roe, they just found that the court's root, the court's reasoning, the court's structure of argument was, well, ooh. The right to privacy, they pointed out, rested on the shakiest of constitutional foundations. As for Roe's trimester framework, this looks like the sort of logically unsatisfactory compromise, many observed, that legislatures tend to arrive at with respect to hard issues. The trimester framework in Roe, again, as many pointed out, looks nothing like what courts, much less the United States Supreme Court, generally does. Fast forward almost 20 years to 1992. Controversies over abortion law had intensified surprising many who thought, wrongly, that public opinion polls showing higher levels of support for abortion back in the 1970s and 1980s among the young meant that over time, opposition to abortion would wither away. In KCB Planned Parenthood of Pennsylvania, 
the court chose to affirm and ringingly affirm the constitutional right to abortion. And in doing so, in reaffirming this right laid out in Roe and much criticized, the court justified its actions largely, not entirely, but largely on grounds of stare decisis. Roe settled this contentious issue a generation ago, the court kept emphasizing, and now we, the court, are going to make it super duper clear to dispel any lingering doubts that we are now settling it for the foreseeable future. But it's crucial to understand that far from reaffirming its reasoning in Roe, the Casey court overhauled Roe and in fact recast Roe. The court in Casey jettisoned Roe's trimester framework, as well as its focus on physician rights. Also gone, almost entirely, were Roe's claims about historic abortion practices. And the right to privacy was far less prominent, replaced by appeals to liberty and to autonomy. And Casey emphasized that viability, which had been mentioned in Roe, although in frankly a pretty offhand way, and viability of course had moved to a significantly earlier time in pregnancy um, since Roe had been decided, Casey emphasized that viability would henceforth constitute a bright line. Before viability, abortion could be regulated as distinct from prohibited, but only if such regulations did not constitute an undue burden on the pregnant woman. Since Casey, the court has continued down this path. That is, it reaffirms abortion rights are in the constitution, justifies its decisions largely, not entirely, but pretty significantly on sorry decisis grounds, while continuing mo continually modifying other aspects of its reasoning. The result has been this, a continually shifting body of doctrine, one that lower courts have found difficult to apply with confidence and specificity. Judge Amal Thapar noted recently in his opinion in Memphis Center for Reproductive Health and Slattery, concurring in the judgment in part and dissenting in part, the undue burden test we are tasked with applying has proved inherently resistant to neutral and principled application. This is in no small part because as Philip D. Williamson documents in his recent article, The Gordian Knot of Abortion Jurisprudence, the court keeps modifying the meaning of the undue burden standard. In the 2016 case, Whole Women's Health, the Hellerstedt, notes Philip Williamson, the court claimed to apply the undue burden standard articulated in Casey, while announcing what seems to be a new test, one that calls on courts to weigh regulations, a regulations benefit against the burdens that it imposes. And the court's 2020 decision in June medical, in, in the June medical case has generated yet more uncertainty about exactly what it is that lower courts ought to be doing. I respectfully suggest that what we are seeing is not the hallmark of a stable precedent on which half a century of constitutional doctrine has been built. Rather, Roe gave way to Casey, which has in turn been substantially modified by later decisions. It is no exaggeration to state that Roe is in effect not really there much, not in evidence anymore. Second issue I wish to address is that of viability. The prominent thread that runs through all the court's major abortion cases is viability. Viability is mentioned in Roe v. Wade, and then viability was brought to the fore in Casey, which emphasizes viability as a crucial consideration in the constitutionality of abortion regulations and prohibitions. Since Casey, this court has, as George Mason Law School professor Eric Clays carefully documents in a forthcoming article in the Georgetown Journal of Law and Public Policy, adhered to viability as a crucial line before which abortion rights may not be unduly burdened, although, as I was just noting, what counts as an undue burden has not been stable. In my view, the viability framework has always been something of an embarrassment. Why? Well, for starters, viability hinges on medical technology. As I just noted, viability has changed significantly since Roe was decided in 1973. And viability also hinges on access to medical technology. Is that really a good way to determine um, rights and obligations? 
And then there are the criticisms of many bioethicists of viability as a standard. Viability doesn't track our serious moral judgments, or so many have argued across the political spectrum, of the circumstances under which life has value. Third issue I'd like to address, that of stare decisis. Stare decisis has loomed very, very, very heavily, very large in the Supreme Court's abortion jurisprudence, and stare decisis arguments are very often advanced in favor of striking down the Mississippi Gestational Age Act. Even if there were more content to Roe and Casey than I believe to be the case, these arguments would, I think, fall short. Why? Well, first, a lot of the stare decisis arguments are rooted in the idea that Roe, and particularly Casey, are super precedents, that there is such thing as a precedent which ought to be accorded particular deference. But that concept, I believe, is circular and conclusory. For Casey's assertion about its strength as a precedent going forward were themselves not grounded in any precedent, constitutional text, or any other source of constitutional authority. Moreover, the factors that justices have, in recent, have recently identified as crucial to the analysis of when stare decisis should have force, all, I believe, militate against any sort of deference, any sort of adherence to Roe and Casey and the court's other abortion precedents. Reliance interests, quality of presidential reasoning, presidential coherence with previous or subsequent decisions, and workability all militate against stare decisis being a factor here. Finally, it's not clear, at least to me, that stare decisis counts for much in Supreme Court practice. As my colleague Fred Schauer recently observed in an article in the Supreme Court Review, for the Supreme Court of the United States, with its small and self-selected docket, heavily populated by issues of high moral and political valence. There does not appear to be in place a stare decisis norm, a norm pursuant to which most of the justices most of the time would feel compelled by internal belief or external pressure to adhere to past decisions, even when those justices believe those decisions to be wrong. Next, institutional legitimacy, particularly the institutional legitimacy of the Supreme Court of the United States. Our system of separation of powers works not only because dividing power prevents concentrations of power and helps preserve liberty, helps to ensure liberty. Also important are questions of institutional competence. Although there is some overlap among what the different branches are called upon to do, it is fair to say that each of our three major branches, executive, legislative, and judicial, has distinct areas of expertise and skill and that one strength of our constitution is that we demand that any part of our government, we do not demand, at least not very often, that any part of our government undertake tasks to which it is ill-suited. In Roe, Casey, and other abortion decisions, what we see is the court taking on what looks like quasi-legislative and or quasi-administrative roles. The court is not, is not entrusted by the Constitution to settle morally fraught controversies, nor is it institutionally equipped to make the sorts of calls that require detailed information from a variety of sources. The issue of the court's legitimacy, I believe, is a critical one. I revere, that is not too strong a word, the Supreme Court of the United States, and I believe that the justices of the Supreme Court are correct to pay attention to concerns that the court could lose stature in the eyes of the public. That said, I believe the bigger risk to the court would be for it to continue in its self-appointed role as settler of serious moral disputes, even as it is clear that a huge chunk of those who are governed by our constitution object to both the courts taking on this role, which doesn't look much like a court, and to the substantive decisions that the court is making as it takes on this role. All right, finally, I see I am almost out of time. Let me just say a few words about what will come next. It's impossible, of course, to predict with a high level of confidence what the court is going to do in especially high profile cases such as this one. That said, I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that while it seems likely right now that the court will step back some 
from abortion. It is highly unlikely that abortion cases are going to vanish from the Supreme Court's docket. Why? Well, first, because it's easy to imagine that states, as states pass laws uh, that the court may face or, or, um, or, the law, or some laws that are in the wings waiting to go into effect, uh, go into effect, the court may face challenges, particularly as applied challenges to highly restrictive abortion laws that in operation, it can be plausibly claimed, pose serious threats to a woman's health or even life. At the other end of the spectrum, Highly permissive abortion laws may be vulnerable to challenge on grounds of fetal personhood. These arguments, which were dismissed in the row, in row, have a lot of moral force. Are they coming soon? I don't know, but they're out there. And I don't think we can dismiss them out of hand. And I think the Supreme Court, if it is, will, um, will have every incentive to get ready to grapple with such arguments. We may also see disputes over congressional regulation of abortion, which will lead to cases involving the scope and nature of Congress's powers under the Commerce Clause, as well perhaps to cases um, that, uh, that test the powers of Congress under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, and perhaps even to segue to Andy's presentation, Congress's powers under the 13th Amendment. So with that as introduction, I turn it over to Andy. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Julia hasn't discussed uh, the situation of the most important people in the abortion controversy. Uh, she's talked about uh, the courts. She's uh, talked about uh, problems with the doctrine. But I'd like to focus attention on the women who are seeking to terminate their pregnancies. An awful lot of them are young, scared, poor. They got terrible sex education and poor access to contraception, and they're facing loss of control over the course of their lives. They have claims with constitutional dimension. I'm going to emphasize an unfamiliar constitutional claim that I regard as the strongest one. My views are atypical, but the Federalist Society invited me, and so I'll tell you what I think. So I want you to imagine a world in which women are forced to bear children. They don't control their reproductive powers. Their bodies are at the command of others. Mere instruments seized and put to the surface of purposes that are not their own. This is not dystopian fiction. This is history. That was the United States before the Civil War for enslaved people who were female. We adopted the 13th Amendment to end the institution of antebellum slavery. All of it, the whole institution, the amendment provides that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. And that has implications for abortion that I've been pressing for a long time. I'm sure you'll think of objections if you Google Andrew Koppelman abortion, the articles uh, I've written are on SSRN, Social Science Research Network. Uh, legal terms very often need unpacking. Law students are sometimes surprised to learn that property is not a single right. It's a bundle of rights. It's a right to use something, to sell it, et cetera. And the same is true of the slavery that the 13th Amendment abolishes. It was a bundle of wrongs, the inability to move freely, to command one's own labor, et cetera. Compulsory pregnancy was one of the worst of the wrongs of antebellum slavery. And the 13th Amendment outlaws the whole bundle. So the Supreme Court has held, for instance, in Jones versus Mayer, that it empowers Congress to prohibit racial discrimination in housing because racial discrimination is a relic of slavery. It itself doesn't enslave anyone, but it is a part of the institution that the amendment abolishes. Uh, the opposite view makes clear the world that abortion bans would bring into existence. At the oral argument in Dobbs, the pending abortion case, Justice Barrett asked a rhetorical question. She asked, to the extent that the consequences of parenting and the obligations of motherhood that flow from pregnancy burden women, why don't the safe haven laws take care of that problem? It is, uh, with all due respect to Justice Barrett, a brutally silly question. Pregnancy is itself physically grueling, more so as it progresses. Adoption is hard. 
many women find it difficult to give up for adoption an infant born of their bodies, and when they do, the experience is often traumatizing. One study found that nine out of 10 women who were denied abortions ended up keeping the baby. And there would be a lot more pressure to do that if abortion were really outlawed. A foster kiss care system would be overwhelmed by more than 800,000 infants every year. Now that's okay only if you think that those women were not entitled to decide for themselves what to do with their lives. Abortion restrictions are totalitarian. They tend to take over and reshape the lives of the women concerned. That loss of control over the course of one's life is, of course, another part of the bundle of wrongs that was slavery. The violation of personal liberty is obvious. The restriction on abortion also violates the amendment's guarantee of equality because forcing women to be mothers makes them into what quite a lot of tradition defined them as a servant caste, a group who by virtue of a status of birth is held subject to a special duty to serve others and not themselves. And here I can mention that abortion restrictions disproportionately burden black women. The argument is not an analogy. The amendment at its core is a break with a reprehensible past, a determination not to repeat certain specific historical wrongs. For a large part of the slave population, loss of their reproductive capacities, compulsion to bear children, whether they wanted to or not, was one of those wrongs. Now, of course, many enslaved women wanted children and parents were devoted to their families despite heartbreaking obstacles, but they didn't have a choice. Their bodily powers were seized in the intrusive, degrading way that is unique to unwanted pregnancy and directed to the end of producing children. That's part of what Harriet Jacobs, who had been a slave, had in mind when she wrote in 1860, slavery is terrible for men, but it is far more terrible for women. No other prohibition in our entire legal system so entirely dominates one's life. Quite a lot of modern constitutional theory focuses on original meaning and the conservatives on the present Supreme Court, quite a lot of them are originalists, that's pertinent here. This amendment was understood to be a radical break with the past, a determination never again to repeat certain past wrongs. In order to give it effect, we have to be clear-eyed about what those wrongs were. The framers unquestionably had a limited view of the evil they were remedying, they would have been surprised to learn that what they were doing had implications for abortion, but they would have been surprised to learn that what they were doing had implications for segregated schools. If we're confined to the view of the framers, then Brown versus Board was, rightly, was wrongly decided, and very few originalists are willing to say that. Uh, now, I want to be clear on what the 13th Amendment argument does and does not do. What it does is it answers the claim that the Constitution says nothing about abortion, which is constantly repeated. It's not a complete defense of Roe. It doesn't address the alleged personhood of the fetus, but it does show that the state, when it forces women to bear children, has a heavy burden of proof. Now, the court, uh, looking at its composition and listening to the oral argument, uh, I'll predict the court will almost certainly overrule Roe. That's going to be a disaster for women, and it's also going to be a disaster for the Constitution, and in particular, for the provision of the Constitution by which the United States, for the first time, became the land of the free. Now, uh, I want to end by taking up uh, a few of Julia's points. She says that there's not much left of Roe, and it is true that there have been lots of doctrinal twists and turns uh, in Roe versus Wade. But again, look at Roe from the perspective of pregnant women seeking abortions. Despite all of the twists and turns, until recently, abortion was available in every state in the United States. Uh, that uh, now, if Roe is overruled, uh, the uh, Guttmacher Institute has uh, studied this. Uh, there are 21 states that are certain to outlaw abortion if they're allowed to do it, probably five more of them. A dozen uh, have uh, laws that uh, spring into existence immediately. Uh, 
There are 11 states with six week bans. Uh, so I, while I, I, the court has manipulated the abortion right in various ways, ways that uh, may be confusing to lawyers, may be confusing even to judges. Uh, women are aware that there are places in their state where it is possible to go to get an abortion. The big thing that would happen if Roe were overruled is that that would stop being the case for many, many women in the United States. On the viability line, uh, so I guess I would begin by saying judges devise tests to implement the Constitution all the time. Uh, if you study the First Amendment, the protection of free speech involves a huge range of complicated three-part tests, some of which involve balancing by courts. I just don't see that there's anything particularly special about the way in which Roe implements the constitutional right. If the right is going to be implemented, the judges have to craft tests. Uh, now, Roe's argument for drawing the line at viability is not particularly persuasive, uh, but the plurality in Planned Parenthood versus Casey is right, also right. There's no other line that's more workable and its imprecision is within tolerable limits. One doesn't need to draw the line precisely at that point or use viability as a trigger, but it is necessary to give women a reasonable opportunity to decide whether to terminate their pregnancies. We already know that the main reason why women delay getting abortions is because the difficulty of obtaining them, it's become more difficult to get abortions as the number of clinics has uh, diminished. Um, the, uh, but abortions are available, 90% uh, of them happen in the first trimester. Uh, it's unusual for them to happen later than that, but drawing the line at uh, the first trimester for some women will mean that abortion is completely unavailable. And wherever you draw the line, uh, some degree of line drawing is absolutely unavoidable in this case if there's going to be an abortion right at all, and it is likely to be somewhere after the middle of uh, the term of pregnancy. On the status of uh, precedent, uh, I will say that I don't really care about the institutional legitimacy. Uh, and I think the discussions of institutional legitimacy distract our attention from the women who are actually going to be hurt. But uh, the court was right in Casey that people have organized intimate relationships and made choices that define them and fuse themselves and their places in society in reliance on the availability of abortion in the event that contraception should fail. Uh, Justice Rehnquist in Casey denied that. He said that that wasn't because of Roe. Uh, I can't quite understand what the argument is that uh, women's determination to advance in their careers is never frustrated by an unwanted pregnancy, that an unwanted pregnancy does not redirect the course of a woman's life, that no first year law student's ambitions will be stymied if she has a baby. I don't really understand what the argument is. And that once again, that's the problem with Justice Barrett's notion that the woman can just give the baby away. Uh, one factor that courts always consider with stare decisis is the practical harm that overruling will do. Here, that harm is pretty massive and it has constitutional dimensions and that weighs against overruling. Uh, on uh, the uh, future direction of uh, the court, uh, I agree that uh, threats to a woman's health or even life are likely to be involved by at least some of the restrictions on abortion that are likely to be enacted. Uh, if the Constitution, though, says nothing about abortion and we're going to defer to the states on all medical procedures, then it's hard for me to see once one said that the burdens on women don't count, uh, how one could avoid 
bringing substantive due process or some variety of it back into play when one considers burdens of this kind. In Roe versus Wade itself, Justice Rehnquist said the Constitution didn't say anything about abortion, but then he said, if we had a law that prohibited abortions even to save the life of the mother, he would think that that was unconstitutional. And so he reached for exactly the same substantive due process that the court relied on. And then we're arguing about which burdens in fact have constitutional dimensions. Uh, so there's broad agreement, at least with, including Justice Rehnquist, that there is a right of some constitutional dimension here. Uh, it is surprising uh, to have to say it, but I'm going to have to say it. Uh, constitutional rights ought to be enforced. I haven't had time to talk about the uh, ridiculous and reprehensible action of the court in allowing the Texas statute to stand, but perhaps we'll have time to get into that in the later discussion. All right, well, thank you. Thank you to uh, Julia and Andrew for those opening remarks. And now I think um, you'll each have some time for rebuttal, although Andrew may have gotten all of his rebuttal out in his opening. So we'll see if he has anything. I'll rebut the rebuttal. Yeah. <laughs> the rebuttal. Let me just make a few brief points because I'm eager for us to move on to, to questions, uh, particularly to hear what's on, what's on the mind of the audience. Andy, first, I've long admired your work for its creativity and its intellectual honesty, and also for your attention to the realities of women's physical existence. I'm only half joking when I note that Roe v. Wade, uh, Justice Blackmun's opinion, has more about men's professional rights than about women's bodies, and that has long seemed to me to be unfortunate. I understand why it happened that way, Back in the 1970s, when Roe was decided, uh, women weren't being prosecuted. It was the physicians were in danger of prosecution. Blackman was very concerned about that. But still, it's um, it's an unfortunate thing. And your work goes a long way toward, toward filling in these gaps. So wonderful and well done. That said, I am not persuaded by your analogies, by your invoke, invocation, rather, of the 13th Amendment. I don't think your analysis sheds much light on the very heartbreaking and very difficult issues of abortion. As you admit in some points, at least in your articles on the 13th Amendment and abortion, and some of the time too, and some points too just now in your discussion, pregnancy is unique. We have analogs to be sure, but they are rough analogs. We don't have any direct thing that we can point to for help. That means we can look to conscription Although, of course, conscription is quite different in the sense that we ask people to die, fight and die for their country and so forth. That's uh, we're asking someone to do something that is for the public good in a way that asking someone to carry a child or donate a kidney to a particular individual or be a regular blood donor um, is not. Um, I, so, but slavery in particular, I think, doesn't take us very far. A uniquely evil institution Slavery brought about a complete taking of labor and not just a complete taking of the ability to own one's labor, to alienate one's labor, to be compensated fairly for one's labor, but also it took the ability to form family attachments. There wasn't marriage under slavery and there was a lot of family breakup. I live just a few miles down the road from Monticello where in the wake of Thomas Jefferson's death, he died as most of you know in terrible debt, a number of slaves were sold off to satisfy the creditors, leading to horrific family breakup. When we discuss abortion and access to pregnancy termination, we are not discussing anything that is like this. To be clear, pregnancy is physically demanding. If pregnancy lasted two days and carried with it no significant health risks, including risks of serious uh, damage to a woman's body and even death, we would be having, I believe, different discussions. So it seems to me that given all that, it makes sense for us going forward to think very carefully about what a world may look like after Roe is overruled, either explicitly or quietly. And my strongest suggestion, and I am eager to hear what others think, is that the court can at the very least arrange things so that it is doing less quasi-legislative stuff, 
less pronouncing that there's a superstar decisis when frankly, no one believes those claims. It looks, I think, fairly ridiculous when it claims that there are super crescents. And instead, step back and focus on doing what courts typically do. I agree with Andy, agree and agree with then Chief Justice Rehnquist, that the possibility that the court will completely clear its docket of abortion cases is remote. And because it will be very possibly called upon to exercise some sort of substantive due process um, analysis, yes, we can imagine there will be cases where what the court is doing will look uh, a bit more legislative than what it does in a number of other cases. But it's a matter of degree for the court to be in the very thick of the settling, the quote, settling of a fraught moral debate. So much of the thick of settling this fraught moral debate that elections are turning on or, elect, or, or a big factor in elections is who's going to be appointed to the Supreme Court and so forth. That seems to me like an unhealthy system. Have the court do what it does in cases of unenumerated rights, substantive due process, and engage in policing outliers, which is a fairly typical role for the court in this area. Let the court uh, be in step with public opinion as it tends to be, and not choose sides in a dispute where there are very big, very, very, very large populations on each side. Uh, and very importantly, let the court allow legislatures, state legislatures in particular, who of course exercise a general police power and are the body that are entrusted in our system primarily with regulating health and safety, with defining life. Just think of all the versions of the Uniform Definition of Death Act and similar statutes that are out there. Uh, is, do they have, do states have complete carte blanche? Uh, I very much doubt it. I think that uh, the courts, particularly the Supreme Court, will be in the wings and may even be active. But that would be a different role, and I submit a more court-like role than the current role the Supreme Court has chosen to take on. All right, I don't think that I'm going to need uh, the full 10 minutes. Um, I agree that pregnancy is unique. That's why I say that the 13th Amendment argument is not an analogy. It is not the case that slaves were subjected to something that is in some way like involuntary pregnancy or that involuntary pregnancy is like what slaves were subjected to. It is what slaves were subjected to. It is the same thing. It is not an analogy. Uh, and I'm happy to admit on the uh, dimensions of the right, uh, you know, the abortion, the 13th Amendment argument, like many arguments, uh, like many constitutional claims, rubs up against other state interests, uh, interests that uh, are increasingly powerful in some contexts than others. Uh, I take it to be a matter of broad general agreement that uh, the state has an overriding interest in preventing infanticide at the end of pregnancy. And between conception and uh, the nine months at the end of pregnancy, there is a great deal of uncertainty about when moral status attaches. I have been through the moral philosophy. The philosophers have not been especially helpful here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I think that uh, all that the court can do is make sure that uh, we do not have a large population of women who are trapped by their pregnancies and who are going to have the baby no matter what. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, protecting abortion in the, at least in the early stages of pregnancy, which is when most abortions happen. Again, you know, 90% of women get their abortions in the first trimester. Women, when they don't wanna be pregnant and they find out they're pregnant, they tend to take care of it pretty quickly. Uh, that, that I take to be the aspect of Roe that needs to be preserved. And that's the aspect of Roe that I think it's just false to say that that has for all practical purposes been overturned. I think that Roe will be overruled. Uh, we, uh, 
the matters will be left to uh, states. Uh, the idea that states can do what they like to uh, people within their borders is one of the questions that uh, is answered negatively by the 13th Amendment. Can I just can I just say one thing in, in response? Andrew, Andy, I think that you are undercutting your own arguments just now in what you said, particularly about uh, reliance on the one hand and about there being no better line than viability on the other. What have people relied on if most abortions take place within 12 weeks? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to make the case that anyone has relied on having availability of abortion up to viability, it seems to me. And in it seems to me that reliance arguments are at best an argument for some kind of transition. Um, and so for, certainly not for, um, not for uh, the sorts of uh, um, uh, holdings as we have seen in the court's abortion jurisprudence enduring forever and ever and ever. So I would, and then in terms of there being other dividing lines, I think no better line than viability. I disagree. In fact, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, initial cardiac activity, brainstem, uh, what we're learning more and more about, the, about uh, life before, um, about life in the womb. I submit to you that there might be a host, right? Well, certainly willing, I'm certainly willing to argue there are hosts of better lines if indeed we end up having to draw lines. So and with that, I look forward to questions. So I'm gonna jump in here and, and send you both back to your corners of the ring and um, start a conversation. And um, then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Just as a reminder, if you have a question for our panelists, please use the raise hand function and I will be able to call on you um, in order of uh, raised hands. So don't use the chat function, use the raised hand function and we'll get some audience questions in at the end. If you are calling in to this, you can use star nine on your phone to, to do the same. So I, I wanna start as uh, any good federal society member with the constitution and um, draw out from Andrew a bit more of, uh, of his sort of unique um, position here. Um, Justice Thomas at oral argument asked the advocates repeatedly where in the constitution is the right to abortion. Um, it seems as if um, you would answer Justice Thomas by pointing to the 13th amendment um, I am curious if you heard either advocate sort of pick up on that thread, that line of reasoning, um, oh, or no, no. like it in Dobbs, if, if you didn't, um, and then if you disagree with a reading of the 14th Amendment as the basis for a right to abortion. So, so to just put it a little bit differently, do you see the 13th Amendment as the only constitutional source for the right to abortion such that you think the current precedent is wrongly decided. Um, so kind of, you know, those start where you will, but those were the few questions I had about your position. Um, I won't say that it's the only argument. It's one that uh, I think is unfamiliar to this audience, which is why it seemed to me to be a good use of uh, my time. But clearly, you know, the reason why sex there's a sex equality dimension to, uh, well, the reason why sex equality raises any 14th Amendment issue at all is the court said in Frontiero, there is a long and unfortunate history of discrimination against women. And I would just add that discrimination has primarily consisted of requiring women to be mothers and having that be the one and only thing that women got to do. That is what sex discrimination consisted in. And so I think we, we have seen the, the court over time, uh, and Julia touched on this, um, shift the constitutional grounding for the oh. right to abortion from liberty to privacy to some of the quality arguments that you were um, just flagging right now. Um, and in doing so, as you both have been discussing, it's shifted the standard for assessing when the state can restrict abortion and mm -hmm. you know, from the trimester framework in Roe to viability only framework in Casey. And you and Julia were sort of discussing this before I interjected. If, if we're grounding the right in the 13th amendment, what if any consequences does that have for the standard that the court would apply? So does it make a practical difference 
uh, in terms of where the court draws the line if it focuses on the 13th Amendment or if it focuses on privacy or autonomy as it has been doing? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how. I mean, the, uh, again, all that the 13th Amendment argument does is answer the claim that we hear over and over again that the Constitution says nothing about abortion. And uh, I mean, this constitutional right, like all of the other constitutional rights, require judge-made law to implement them. And the judges take into account other interests besides the constitutional right that they regard as important enough to allow the constitutional right to be overridden in particular situations. Those other interests are going to have the same dimensions however you ground the constitutional right. But let's be clear about what we're arguing here. The uh, question of where the line is going to be drawn that's actually before us is that the court, I predict with some confidence, is going to say the line is drawn nowhere. A state can, and I'm pretty sure that in short time, some state will say any woman who obtains an abortion in this case will serve 10 years in the penit penitentiary. And that will raise no constitutional issue and be subject to the rational basis test. That's what we're really arguing about here, not viability. So in terms of, of line drawing, just moving on to, to another approach, um, I want to get both your thoughts on the possibility of a compromise outcome here. So you, you both seem to predict that the court is going to overrule Row, but some have suggested that the court would simply revise the viability for a standard from Casey, push it back to 15 weeks or, or some other new line. Um, some read the, the chief's questions during oral argument to suggest this approach. Um, mm -hmm. And one could argue that this approach has the added benefit of allowing the sort of um, strategic gradualism that the chief seems to value. So rather than overruling Roe and Casey in, in one swoop, the court could uphold the law without eliminating the right to elective abortion and then chip away at the precedent um, over time. Um, picking up on, on some of what Julia was saying at the beginning, this gradualism does seem to, apologies for the dog in the background, um, the, the gradualism seems to have difficulties that have plagued abortion jurisprudence over time. So do you, is there a principled um, or workable basis for a half measure here? And is a, is a compromise of that nature an exercise in the sort of judicial restraint that the chief has valued or, or do you see it as something else? I think it is, it is hard to say. I was very interested in the chief's line of questioning in the oral argument. I saw it less as an indication of what he might be inclined to do in this case, and more as the chief is doing his job as chief justice, which is to figure out what all the possibilities are. He wanted, understandably, Mississippi to elaborate on a few fairly throwaway uh, arguments that Mississippi argued, kind of maybe arguments the alternative toward the very end of the state's brief. But as we heard in the Dobbs oral argument, the um, Mississippi was not uh, about to do that. And it was very striking that both all in the um, making their oral arguments in Dobbs were pretty much uh, adhering to all or nothing strategies, at least the vast majority of the time. I do agree that whatever the court, if the court is looking for a way to uphold the Gestational Age Act, um, it is not going to get much help from any of its precedents. Sharif Girgis of Notre Dame Law School in a paper coming out in the Georgetown Journal of Law and Public Policy um, has argued that uh, a ruling upholding this Mississippi's ban um, in effect uh, couldn't, is going to have a hard time relying on Casey. So, but that's not to say that the court couldn't find some other line. As I've just said to Andrew, I think that there are other lines that would be, uh, be far more uh, defensible uh, than, um, than, than, than the viability line, not least because so far as we can understand public attitudes on abortion, and to be sure, issue polling is, is, is a, very tricky, um, a very tricky thing to decipher, but the populace does seem to support stricter limits on abortion than um, are currently in force with the court's own made, own um, self, um, own constructed viability standard. So we will see. 
I agree with that prediction. Yeah. No, no points that round. So um, I want to I want to move um, to sorry decisis and, and precedent. Um, we heard during oral argument, um, the Council for um, the Center for Reproductive Rights and the Solicitor General of the United States both contend that precedent can't be overruled just because it's wrong. And this was one of the more remarkable um, exchanges during oral, oral argument, at least to me, involved in this position. And it um, was when we heard Justice Alito um, question the Solicitor General over the idea that if the court had reheard Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine one year later, would it have been sufficient for the court to say it was an egregiously wrong decision that now should be overruled, even if nothing else had changed. So in short, would the wrongness of the previous case be enough to overrule it? So I'm interested in what you both made of this exchange and is this the right standard for overruling precedent? So as, as the Solicitor General argued, um, both the decision was wrong and to use her phrasing, there's some new materially changed circumstances or some kind of materially new argument um, that we need both of those prongs in order to be overruling precedent. Um, so is that the right standard that we should be applying and, and sort of how does that standard play out here? Well, I mean, it's uh, the presumption against overruling precedent is a standard. It's not a rule. So anybody who proposes an algorithm for when to overrule precedent is, I think, being silly. It uh, Precedent means at least that there is a presumption in favor of leaving settled law in place, and you should overrule for some reason other than if you were writing it on a blank slate, you would decide it differently. But certainly how wrong the earlier decision was plays into the question. Part of the problem here, of course, is that you're talking to an audience of judges who despise Roe versus Wade and think that it's deeply wrong. I disagree with them about that. Uh, and so uh, that uh, I think inclines advocates to uh, put more stress on press on that aspect of precedent uh, than I think they should. But the other aspect of precedent that I think matters here is reliance. If you are going to tell a woman, let's imagine you've got a married woman and she's a college sophomore and she's planning on going to the very expensive law school that uh, Julia teaches at or I teach at, uh, and uh, you know. Once Roe is overruled, you have to say to her, hey, look, you know, you, you've got to keep in mind, honey, the contraception sometimes fails. And if you get pregnant after your first semester, first year of law school, you are going to be spectacularly in debt. And it is quite doubtful that you'll be able to finish law school. And so there you'll be with no law degree and all of this debt. Maybe you'd better rethink going to law school. Maybe going to law school is a thing for guys. Um, and it's clear that that's going to be the effect of overruling Roe, that women are going to have to modify their professional ambitions because they are in much more danger of being in the situation of having a kid they didn't want. And it's just silly to say that that doesn't affect women's opportunities or that women have not up until now assumed that they could control their fertility and from now on they won't be able to in half the states. I'm not persuaded. Just for starters, some of the other lines that we have been discussing would not have, if drawn right, would not have the same kind of cataclysmic effect you're describing, nor would a society where there are more options for women to, be, to go to law school and have children. I think it is imperative that all top law school, that all law school programs be compatible with parenthood. I have made this argument many, many, many times. In answer to the issues that Stephanie raises about stare decisis, I have to admit that I laughed out loud when I read the passage from a brief of distinguished constitutional law professors, including Erwin Chemerinsky, Sherry Kolb, Michael Dorff, Daniel Farber, and Jeffrey Stone, and Lawrence Tribe, among others, when they write that stare decisis is the bedrock of the Supreme Court's legitimacy. I think that is absurd. I think stare decisis is indeed a standard. I think it puts a thumb on the scale. I think precedent is important, but precedent is just one of many factors to be taken into when 
we, when courts make decisions, when interpreting and constructing the Constitution, courts look to text and history and structure to prudential considerations, to moral considerations, along with precedent. I think that my colleague Fred Schauer had it absolutely right in the passage of his, in his that I just uh, read from, his uh, recent Supreme Court Review article, where as a descriptive matter, Fred is not making a normative claim here, but he is making a descriptive claim, and I think he has nailed it to say that there doesn't appear to be in place much of a stare decisis norm in the Supreme Court, and that that is only to be expected when the Supreme Court has a small self-selected docket heavily populated by issues of very high moral and political heft. At that point, it would be to me quite stunning if precedent were the primary, much less the dominant, um, much less a dominating uh, factor. So I disagree with the idea that stare decisis uh, should play or even can play a huge role here. So, so picking up on the on the reliance interest theme, um, to me, one of the interesting developments around Dobbs is that we've seen, um, I think, more so than in prior uh, abortion cases that the court has taken up, we've seen both pro-choice and pro-life advocates suggesting that it's time to give up on the court to to settle the issue around abortion, and uh, you know, built into that may be. Andrew, as you have indicated, an expectation that the court is going to overrule Roe, um, but we've seen them focus instead on pushing for legislative efforts, pushing electoral politics as the, the next wave of uh, um, where, where the fight over this issue is going. So for example, Catherine Colbert had a piece in the New York Times. Um, she argued Casey, as, as you know, on behalf of Planned Parenthood um, she had a piece to this effect in the New York Times, basically saying um, we need to, to leave our efforts at the court behind us and refocus our efforts at um, Congress, at legislative bodies, at the states, and make this a, a legislative focus and, and a political focus instead of a judicial focus. So I'm curious um, what you both make of those arguments and, and what you think that means for the court and, and the state of the law. I agree. Okay. Completely. I still see a role for the courts, as I have detailed. However, I believe that Roe and then later on Casey short-circuited very important and very, very difficult moral debates that as a society we need to have. Now, where will this come out? I do not know. I do agree with Andrew 100% that moral philosophers have not been as helpful to us as we would like. We have, of course, a whole literature now on trolley problems and all kinds of fanciful, uh, fanciful uh, uh, hypotheticals that, that, that really don't map well at all onto the actual decisions that actual people make that are heart-rending and difficult. I believe that it is primarily the responsibility of legislative bodies in our system, the state legislatures, to determine when life begins. But I do think there is going to be a role for the courts, and why we will have to see how much of a role for the courts there is, depending on what state legislatures do. I think that even as a society, we begin to work through the difficult question of what constitutes a person. Is there a point at which a fetus counts as a person? And if so, how, what point? And exactly how, which rights that people generally have, inheritance rights, et cetera, et cetera, will this fetus have at the right, at the point of quote, personhood. But that will only open up a number of other hard questions. Even if you would look at a fetus in the womb at a particular time and say, yes, I call that fetus a person, there are still hard questions of what we ask one person to do for another. Do we, we, do we have had lots of discussions. These are not exact analogs like Andrew's slavery analog, um, but they nevertheless are, are striking analogs and ones that tend to get a lot of people thinking. What would, you, what would your reaction be to a law that mandated people to be kidney donors under certain circumstances 
or to be regular blood providers? What if you have a rare blood type and on and on? Under what circumstances do we conscript our citizens or residents and send them to be possibly killed or gravely injured? These are very difficult questions and we simply haven't been addressing them in the context of pregnancy. And I hope that we're going to start doing so with respect and with acknowledgement of how difficult these questions are. Yeah, with respect to uh, those, uh, the, uh, those considerations, um, the, uh, it is relevant. Donald Regan wrote a defense of Roe uh, years ago, pointing out that uh, no duty to rescue, no obligation to bear burdens on behalf of other citizens is imposed on anybody except outside the context of pregnancy. And so that suggests that the overall pattern of the law is to value women's liberty and equality less than that of other citizens. And that, I once again, if we're going to look past the court, not place weight on precedent, not place weight on nose counting and try to figure out what the Constitution actually says, that's relevant. The uh, giving up on the court, I think, you know, in the face of defeat, you retreat. Uh, the uh, the retreat from Dunkirk does not show that the British were wrong. It just shows that uh, you know, military reality was what it is. Given who's on the court now, uh, one has to look somewhere other than the court. I agree with Julia that it should be easier than it is now to have a child and pursue other opportunities. And this is an area of agreement between the pro-lifers and the pro-choicers that has not been pursued. And it's really unfortunate. When Bill Clinton ran for president, he said that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. One way of making it rare is to notice when women are asked why they are having abortions, quite a lot of them point to financial constraints as a reason uh, for having abortion, is indicating that if it were not so hard, to have the child, some of them would go ahead and have the child, but some of them would not. And if you make available to them all of these supports, but they say, look, it's my life and uh, my body and I wanna do something else with it, they ought to be able to make that decision. The 13th Amendment means that individuals get to decide what their lives are going to be. Other people don't get to make it for them. So in response to your comment about duty to rescue, two important points. First, the reason for not having a duty to rescue might not be a moral judgment. It might be practical judgment, right? Lots and lots and lots of things. And this is highly relevant to what may be coming, assuming that there is significant cutback uh, or, or there's uh, overruling, if we want to call it that, of Roe and Casey. Just because one believes, for example, that life begins at conception or at the first cardiac activity at roughly six weeks, doesn't necessarily mean that a state legislator would vote for a prohibition, right? There are a lot of things that go into a decision as to whether or not to support or not a law. And moral considerations, so very, very, very important, are not the whole ballgame. But with the duty to rescue, so with the duty to rescue, it may well be eh, a duty to rescue in tort law. I mean, this is just going to be a mess. Let's just not have it. And we might also say there aren't that many times where a toddler falls into a pond and a law professor could easily fish the toddler out of the pond and the law professor doesn't do so. And if we were living in a society with a bunch of people who just strolled away whenever a child was wandering into the street, whenever an old person fell in a crosswalk and others just pointed and laughed, we might have a different system. And then second point is maybe we, and so maybe we have it wrong. We might say, maybe if we look at pregnancy and think about obligations, maybe that changes how we view the absence of a duty to rescue. I'm just throwing all these things out and saying, these are the kinds of discussions that I want to have. The questions are difficult and the answers are inevitably far from satisfactory. I think though we do need to go forward and be our very best selves. So, so both of you, um touched on the new Texas law, um, SB8, which um, prohibits 
physicians from performing an abortion if a fetal heartbeat is detected and then um, directs enforcement through private actions as opposed to allowing state officials to bring um, criminal prosecutions or, or civil actions. And um, as Julia, you mentioned, this was, and I think Andrew, you mentioned this too, um, this was, um, uh, you know, went up to the court at the same time that briefing and oral argument on Dobbs uh, was happening. And so lots of conversation around Dobbs and um, what Dobbs means for Roe has been tied up in conversations around um, this Texas bill and the proceedings around it. Um, and so, so Julia, I wonder if you could speak to whether this is the sort of litigation that you foresee the court having to deal with post Roe, if, if it overturns Roe and Dobbs, are these the sorts of challenges that we can anticipate? Um, or is it, uh, you know, do, do, do future um, cases at the court look different if the court overrules Roe and Dobbs? Well, I hope not. I think that SBA has been something of a mess. It involves a lot of uh, difficult and technical aspects of federal court's doctrine, and it makes it particularly difficult then for it to be clear to the public what the court is doing. When I think about things that could erode the court's legitimacy in the eyes of the public, this is exactly the kind of case that, um, that concerns me. A high profile subject, so that there's an enormous amount of press coverage, but uh, such complexity to the uh, legal doctrine and to the institutional roles of the court and other bodies it's, that it's impossible for uh, news outlets, even ones that attempt to engage in sophisticated analysis to deliver um, an accurate um, and timely description of what's going on uh, to, their, to their viewers and readers. I would suggest this um, for the court to think very carefully about its standing doctrine with respect to abortion. Uh, there were some excellent comments made by Justices Thomas and Alito in their opinions in the June medical case. Abortion has managed over time to get a lot of special treatment from the Supreme Court, and I'm not entirely sure why. So there is no reason, I argue, that the abortion providers should be able to vindicate the rights of women, that is, should be accorded standing, which they have been for a long time now, in order to challenge when constitutional challenges to abortion laws. I would prefer a world in which the court standing doctrine does not have a special carve out, a special rule for abortion cases, which it seems to have, but instead for the court to normalize abortion so that uh, standing, uh, standing uh, rules are pretty much of a piece with, with, um, with other areas of the law. I think that would go a long way toward avoiding uh, cases that, um, that threaten to undermine the court's, uh, the court's legitimacy. Uh, it's hard to imagine standing doctrine undermining the court's legitimacy when the public generally doesn't understand it. Um, but uh, I will say uh, this, and I also want to say something about the Texas law. So uh, the test for two-party standing in Singleton versus Wolf. Uh, well, first of all, I mean there is the problem that uh, you know the way that federal litigation goes, uh, the pregnancy will be over by the time uh, any case gets to the court of appeals. Uh, so it's possible that there are elaborate devices to get around this, but it's going to be cumbersome no matter what you do. Uh, the test in Singleton is, well, that uh, a litigant can assert the constitutional rights of a non-party uh, if the two have a close enough relationship that the former is fully or very nearly as effective a proponent of the right as the latter. And clearly, the abortion clinics have a uh, strong incentive to assert the right to abortion. And there exists some hindrance to the third party asserting its own constitutional rights, which the limited duration of pregnancy is. So, and there's no question that the abortion clinics have injuries in fact themselves, they are threatened with going to jail if they facilitate someone else exercising their constitutional rights. Um, 
On uh, the Texas statute, I should say that uh, the problem with the Texas statute is not specific to abortion. You can use the same trick with respect to any constitutional right you like. So let's imagine that a state passes a law that says, if anybody says anything nice about Antonin Scalia, they can be sued for $10,000. And uh, you know, they can be sued in a court 300 miles from their home. So if you say something nice about Scalia and then someone sues you, you don't hire a lawyer and respond, you're going to face a big default judgment. So you better get a lawyer to go to that place 300 miles away, even eventually, though eventually you'll get the suit dismissed on First Amendment grounds. It will have cost you thousands of dollars in attorney's fees. You really had to best keep your opinions to yourself. And you can do this with any constitutional right that you, that the state legislature happens not to like. The fact that the court allowed constitutional rights to be nullified in this way is grossly irresponsible, not just with respect to abortion, but with respect to any constitutional right whatsoever that a state legislature might want to limit. So a quick response to Andy's claim that the interests of the abortion clinics, the interests of women are pretty much aligned. I think that's not true. And I think we should be very careful not to assume that the interests of medical entities and the interests of prospective patients are aligned. I think that there can be serious divergences of interest and that, uh, that we ought to pay very, very careful attention to that. I understand his point about the temporal complications, but as Andy noted, there are workarounds, and I would suggest that we pursue such workarounds. As for the possible mischief that uh, various permutations of statutes that are inspired by SB 8 could bring, yes, I agree with Andy that that's something that we need to take a careful look at, that courts are going to have to wrestle with. And my prediction is that we will not see a mushrooming of similar statutes pertaining to Second Amendment rights and First Amendment rights and so on and so forth. I believe that there are going to be some growing pains and a learning curve. I am confident that uh, the Supreme Court uh, is going to figure out uh, various doctrines for, um, for grappling with, uh, with these sorts of laws. So let's take that um, point of agreement and then turn to some questions from the audience. So I see um, Chase Vinci has his or her hand raised. So uh, Chase, do you have a question for our panelists? Yes, can you hear me very well? A little louder. Yes, uh, many people in this country believe in a higher being, a supreme God over Israel. Uh, so certainly in the minds of many, they're looking for some sort of higher order reasoning uh, as to when life begins, just to draw attention to what the Bible says, it says in Isaiah 14, 21, prepare a place to slaughter his children for the sins of their ancestors. But it also says in Isaiah 49, 1, before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He has spoken my name. So there's clearly some instances when justification is, is there's justifiable murder, but life also happens to be predestined. So do we have justification under any circumstance to take that life away? Uh, but I, as I understand, if the claim is that the question of when life begins is uh, settled by certain passages in the Bible, I'd have to refer you to the religion clauses of the Constitution, uh, which uh, since the beginning of the uh, country has uh, meant that uh, the government can't take an official line on the truth of religious propositions. That has pretty consistently been honored across time. And uh, well, so uh, the claim that uh, one's going to derive US laws from uh, readings of the Bible, um, I don't know where to begin. I might um, adjust the question a little bit. I'll take referee privileges. So. Um, we heard Justice Sotomayor, I think, ask a, a, a similar question at oral argument, right? It was something to the effect of, it, isn't it a religious belief as to when life begins, that life begins at conception? 
No. Um, and so I, I'll just sort of reframe it in the context of the Dobbs oral argument and then put it back to, to Julia to answer or to Andrew if he wants to, to reframe. Philosophy is useless. People reach somewhere else. <laughs> no, not at all. I don't think that it's all, it's not all religion. I think that the teachings of religion uh, are going to be very important, are and are going to be very, very important going forward in determinations about what constitutes life, when life begins, when human life begins, when one is, when, 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 uh, how to define a person, uh, what the consequences are of definitions, various definitions of person. Yes, religion is important, but there are many, many, many people who identify strongly as pro-life who don't have any religious commitments whatsoever. Science is also important um, and, and so forth. Now, can science and religion answer all our questions? Of course not. And moral philosophy, as Andy and I have been, I guess, beating up on them a little bit, I would say, I would say philosophy has a lot to tell to teach us too, and so forth, even if even if a lot of um, a lot of uh, current moral philosophical uh, um, scholarship has been to my mind anyway, a little bit uh, more than a little bit disappointing in the abortion context. So this just goes to the um, the, the point that, that that so many things come in in attempting to grapple with these questions of what is a life, what is a person, and what kinds of and what is permissible and not permissible in terms of action that affects life or people. And we're just going to have to, um, we're just going to have to, I, I think, uh, uh, have more conversations uh, about this. And in addition, lots and lots and lots of conversations about the social welfare state, about the safety net, about how institutions are going to be more welcoming uh, to, uh, to actual or potential parents, if that is indeed something. I think Andy and I agree on this, but uh, if that is indeed something that does command a supermajority consensus, then let's get started on it. So we have a, another um, audience question. Uh, Hari Asori, please ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Koppelman and Professor Mahoney for your time. It's really wonderful to hear both of you speak. My question specifically is for Professor Koppelman and, his, um, and your framing of the 13th Amendment here. I know that you said that it's inherently trying to stop a bundle of wrongs as you described it. I was just wondering, couldn't that reasonably be interpreted as other wrongs? For example, couldn't you, uh, couldn't you say that what it's trying to prevent here is forced conception, for example? So why wouldn't that be more of a grounds to say that courts have to allow for a rape or incest exception than to any categorical right? And why is the interpretation of what the wrong is here specifically, you know, viability or up to viability, even if that framework is adopted? Um, well, as I've said, viability is judge-made law, and the uh, 13th Amendment, I don't think, changes the analysis either way. Uh, I will say, as soon as you say, well, okay, the 13th Amendment argument works, but only in cases of rape, we know with some confidence that uh, the amount of non-consensual sex that occurs in the world, it vastly exceeds the uh, proportion of sexual episodes which are adjudicated to be rape by courts. So uh, we know that uh, at least that set of pregnancies is uh, you know, broader than just the adjudicated rapes. Uh, and you're also going to have to think more generally about the circumstances of what kinds of choices is it reasonable to put a person to? I and mean, this is true of slavery too. I mean, the work of the slave is done with the voluntary movement of the muscles because the slave fears something worse. Is it reasonable to uh, expect women to contracept if they've had lousy sexual education and don't know how to contracept, which is still true of many girls in the United States? Uh, is it reasonable to expect a married woman to refrain from sex with her husband, knowing that contraception sometimes fails? Is it reasonable to expect celibacy from human beings? Uh, it's a pretty demanding thing to expect from people. Um, and so then you get into those questions about uh, you know, what kinds of uh, 
burdens is it reasonable to put on somebody? And I think you're going to find that that covers a broader range of pregnancies, much broader range of pregnancies than the adjudicated rapes. I mean, part of the problem here is that the circumstances that led to pregnancies are going to vary from one woman to another, and the state is going to have a lot of trouble telling them apart. So we have a, a question in the chat, I think that's related um, to, to the one that was just asked, which is, um, again, for Andrew, um, so uh, you note that pregnancy becomes more burdensome as it progresses. Under Roe and Casey, abortion uh, can be prohibited until the child is viable. Um, under your 13th Amendment argument, do you agree that there is an unfettered right to abortion through all nine months of pregnancy? Uh, I don't think that follows at all any more than with respect to any other constitutional right. Uh, you can impeach any constitutional right with uh, the extreme examples of its abuse that courts don't tolerate. This is Holmes's example of shouting fire in a theater. Uh, and on the basis of uh, that triumphant example, he sent to prison somebody who had sent out, who had distributed a pamphlet asking people to petition their government to repeal a law. Um, the, uh, I think all the 13th Amendment argument shows you is the unacceptability of the regime that we are going to in fact get, where in half the states, the moment a woman discovers that she's pregnant, she is going to know that she has no recourse unless she has the resources to travel hundreds of miles. So the question of what happens in the developing stages of pregnancy, absolutely irrelevant, because in those states, none of those lines are going to be drawn. If she gets an abortion, she's going to be breaking the law. In the seventh, in, in the eighth week of pregnancy, she won't be able to have an abortion. That's the world that we're actually looking at. That's the world that the argument that Roe should be overruled needs to defend. There is a point here that I think deserves to be made. The burdens of pregnancy don't necessarily become greater with the passage of time. To be sure, the gestating fetus child embryo becomes larger. But for many women, the early stages of pregnancy are the most difficult because mm -hmm. it then that women have more sickness, more hyper, even hyperkinesis and so forth. So as I say, the questions are complicated ones. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that gives us that much help when it comes to thinking about pregnancy. Well, I think we are um, running up against time. So I'll give you both um, just a minute or two for any closing remarks. I would simply add to what we put on the table already that we need to take a very careful look at the contours of the police power, that general regulatory power pursuant to which state legislatures enact basic health and safety regulation. Because it's not simply a matter of rights, as Justice Thomas, uh, I think, honed in on exactly the right questions in the oral argument in Dobbs to ask where this right to abortion is located, but there are also questions about the police power of the states. And here again, there are going to be important questions about who has power, who decides what constitutes life, who has power to decide what constitutes humanity, and what are the limits of those powers, and what are the consequences of those determinations. I just want to end by uh, returning the focus away from these complicated questions of legal doctrine to the predicament of these women who thought that they had other plans for their lives who had other things that they wanted to do with their lives and who are now going to be told, well, you know, it's perfectly fine to have such ambitions if you're male, but if you're female, at any moment, you can discover that you are going to have an entirely different biography and that you've got no control over that. Uh, if uh, stare decisis at its core means courts should think about the consequences of overruling a precedent before they do it, then these consequences should loom large. Not technical questions about respect for the court. I don't care about respect for the court. I care about people having control over their own lives. That's what we were supposed to be protecting when we abolished slavery. 
Well, thank you to, to Andrew and to Julia for um, all those wonderful insights tonight. I think uh, it's fair to say that um, although you both uh, seem to be predicting that the court will overturn uh, Roe this term, I, I think it's also fair to say that these conversations will not come to an end anytime soon and that we can anticipate many more federal society conversations about them. So thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Um, and it was great to be with you all. Yeah. Thank you. And I look forward to further discussions. Yep. On behalf of the Fed Columbia Federalist Society chapter, we uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in. I'd like to thank our fighters, Professor Mahoney, Professor Koppelman, as well as our referee, uh, Stephanie, for their insights. We hope to see many of you in Charlottesville uh, on March 4th through 5th at UVA Law for a symposium on the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists revisiting the founding debates. And, uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you.